fireside chat. And we are being recorded officially. So this fireside chat is organized by European Interfaith Youth Network of Religions for Peace and United Religions Initiative Europe. And I'm, I'm pleased to be your moderated moderator today. Uh, and my name is Emina Ferliak because I didn't introduce myself beforehand. So European Interfaith Youth Network of Religions for Peace is a network of young people and youth organizations and youth chapters of organizations, which is dedicated to interfaith cooperation primarily among young people in Europe, but also internationally. European Interfaith Youth Network is a part of Religions for Peace Europe, and together with other three co-committees, we are forming a huge network of people dedicated to interfaith cooperation in Europe. Other three co-committees are European Women of Faith Network, European National Interreligious Bodies, and European Council of Religious Leaders, also known as ECRL. Religions for Peace Europe is a part of a global family of Religions for Peace, which is the largest worldwide alliance of religious communities. And the Global Religions for Peace Network consists of 90 national member associations in almost as many countries, with six regional interfaith community committees. And I would like now to ask our colleagues from United Religions Initiative Europe to share a few words about URI. And we are happy to have with us today uh, coordinator of the Euro, Euro, URI Europe, Karima Staub. And Karima, could you please tell us a few words about URI Europe, one of the organizers of this event as well? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Amina, uh, for organizing this wonderful webinar. Yeah, I'm Karima Stauch, and I'm the European Coordinator of United Religions Initiative. And some of you may know URI, United Religions Initiative, is an interfaith network as well. Um, it, it consists of member groups who have at least seven members of three different faith traditions or indigenous traditions or spiritual expressions and work on the common goods according to your eye charter. And my dear colleagues, Leila hassan diapo and Angelina Vladikova are also here and some others like Elizabeth in Austria and Morgana. And um, well, Europe is one of eight world regions in United Religion Initiative like North America, Africa, Asia, and so on. And yeah, it uh, has a UN association, it has a youth branch, and I'm really thrilled that we have that collaboration with Religions for Peace and its youth network. And gratitude also to my colleague Leila for co-organizing this with Emina. Thank you so much, Karima. It's always wonderful to hear from you, but also to learn more about URI Europe and to present this wonderful organization, which is also one huge coalition of uh, grassroots uh, interfaith organizations and people from all around the world uh, who are joining this movement to, to bring peace, healing, and um, uh, interfaith dialogue uh, on grassroots levels as well. Now, I would like to say um, and share a few words on the format of the conversation. Uh, so we call this fireside chat, and it's a more personal and interactive discussion involving a moderator and guests, and it's allowing an audience to gain insights into the guest's personal stories and thoughts on various topics. And fireside chat aims to make everyone feel relaxed and leave the audience with more information than before. So this is not a panel discussion or a conference. So we don't have prepared slides or prepared notes, et cetera. We are just like having more of a non-formal conversation, informal conversation with our guests, but there is also time for audience to speak. So we will also have time for your reflections or some of your questions. And the questions will be more focused on getting speakers' personal opinions on the topic of the fireside chat. And today our topic is women, positive peace and religion. And um, I would like also to say just a little bit, uh, some, something just a little bit more about uh, religion, about peace and about women as well, and the connection of these, uh, these three important uh, topics that we decided to put together today. So we often hear that religion and violence are interconnected and that societies with a more religious population are more prone to violence and conflicts. 
The relationship between religion, between violence, and between peace is often seen as black and white without grasping the complexity of these phenomena. But despite the belief held by some and popularized by portions of the media that higher rates of religion necessarily correspond to violence, particularly between divergent religious groups, Institute for Economics and Peace data suggests that there is no correlation between the world's least peaceful countries and high level of religiousness. Likewise, no stati statistically significant relationship, either positive, either negative, exists between the world's most peaceful countries and their recorded rates of religiosity. Other factors are more statistically associated with conflict and religion can be hijacked by violent groups to further their causes. So in this conversation, we will focus on positive peace and religion, and I would like to say a few words also on positive peace. While negative peace is defined as an absence of war, and violence does not capture a society's tendencies towards stability and harmony, positive peace, on the other hand, is much more complex. And we can see positive peace as a system. So positive peace is defined as a more lasting peace, like it's built on sustainable investments in economic development and institutions, as well as social attitudes that foster peace. So Institute for Economics and Peace actually talks about eight pillars of positive peace. Maybe some of you are familiar with them, maybe some not. And these pillars actually function as a system and they are supporting each other. So I'm just going to briefly tell you these eight, these eight uh, pillars of positive peace, but I'm encouraging you to uh, find out more about them on the internet and on the website of Institute for Economics and Peace. And they are talking about these eight pillars, which is well-functioning government, and probably most, more, most of us will actually, uh, um, let's say, agree that well-functioning government is a good pillar to have positive peace. Then equitable distribution of the resources in the society. Then they say also free flow of information is one of the pillars. Good relations with neighbors is one of the pillars as well. Higher levels of human capital in the society. For example, I'm coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina and we are actually now, let's say, uh, very short with the human capital because many people are leaving the country and it's a brain drain that we are experiencing. So this is definitely affecting the society as a whole, but also it's affecting the peacefulness in the society. Acceptance of the rights of the others is one very important pillar of the positive peace. And I think that we can see that in many countries, in many parts of the world where the rights of the others are not respected, there is really a lack of peace, any kind of peace, let alone positive peace. Low levels of corruption is one of the pillars and probably we will all agree with this one. And finally, sound business environment is something that we have to have in mind if we are talking about positive peace. So during this fireside chat, we would like to dive deeper into the connection between religion and positive peace with one particular emphasis. That's the role of women. So women in many societies play important part either in negotiation, either in keeping or in building peace, but they are often put aside and their efforts stay under the, under the radar. So often they do a lot of work behind the scenes and they are the ones who are keeping communities together. I already introduced myself, but I'm again going to repeat my name. I am Emina Ferliak and I'm coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina and I'm a program coordinator within Youth for Peace, which is an organization based in Sarajevo, but I'm also an international youth committee member of Religions for Peace and I actually have the privilege to moderate this conversation today. And today with me I have two incredible young women leaders coming from Argentina and coming from South Africa. With us we have Ms. Melody Amal Khalil Kabalan who is the president of the Islam for Peace Institute Argentina, which has gender and diversity and inter-religious dialogue departments, promoting the Islamic values of peace and equality. 
She is a member of Religious for Peace and Women of Faith Networks. And in 2015, she founded the NGO, afifa.org, to honor women from Arab and Muslim identities. Afifa conducts seminars, workshops, and produces publications to demystify prejudices about Muslim women in the Arab world. Also in 2017, she co-founded Diversity Network, which is a community dedicated to peace and conflict resolution through youth. And she's also a Kaiseed Fellow. And according to what I know, this year she should publish her first book about children and interfaith, and I'm looking forward to that. So Melody, thank you for being with us today. It's a pleasure and honor to have you. Our second speaker is Miss Marilyn Chitarai, who serves the Religious for Peace Youth Media team and is currently based in Durban, South Africa. She, ha she has Bachelor of Architecture Studies degree. She works as a graphic artist and 3D designer and also architectural technologist with 13 years of experience in the realm of social and sustainable architecture. She also uh, traveled a lot to many countries since 2013. She was serving, networking, and building spiritual relations at various religions for peace conferences. And since, since 2009, she has been on many spiritual retreats and pilgrimages with her Sadhguru, Paramahasa Vishwanananda. Unfortunately, Marilyn was uh, not able to join us in person because there are power cuts in uh, South Africa, so there's no electricity for her, uh, so she cannot join us, but she was so eager and so happy to be here, she decided to record us her responses to the questions uh, that I was supposed to ask her and Melody. So she recorded those videos, she provided us with her insights, and my colleague Leila will be, let's say, uh, providing her voice, and she will be able to, uh, to let's say, give us Marilyn's answers. Unfortunately, she won't be here to, you know, engage in more uh, conversation and, and maybe in some discussions afterwards, uh, but we are extremely grateful to her, and we are so, let's say, sad that she was not able to join us, but Thanks, thankful we uh, had this, uh, let's say, opportunity to at least foresee these, for, uh, these uh, power cuts and be able to have Marilyn at least through video recordings. So after I spoke so much, I think it's time to speak to, to our uh, guests. Uh, so ladies, thank you again for being with us here and let us start. I have my first question for you, and I will first ask Melody to, to answer uh, the very first question that I'm really interested in, and that's what does peace mean to you? So how would you define it, Melody? Hello, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My wish for, uh, for peace to, to, to all the audience here, and thank you very much, Amina. You know that uh, after we met each other in Religion for Peace, meeting into New York, you, you become my sister. So this is something special from the Interfed networking. And um, before uh, answering uh, the first question, I would like to thank the, the Religion for Peace um, Network in Europe and United Religious Initiative Europe that I had the chance to meet them and, and participate with them many times thanks of the Interfed uh, commitment. Regarding what peace means to me is an interesting question because uh, we have a lot of uh, um, answers. What peace means, what positive peace means uh, from many scholars, books, and our trainings. But especially what means to me peace is something that each time while I'm in, in this amazing um way of peace i'm asking myself what really peace means for me and regarding this uh these events that we are today in this higher chat that we are focusing in in the role of the women uh i can say to all of you that uh, we cannot talk about uh, a positive peace if we are not counting the, the agreement into any decision, into any uh, debate or interfaith dialogue 
as we are doing with, with men. We know that for many decades, we saw the picture of our brothers from different religions and faith uh, meeting each other to resolve, to, uh, to make peace, to contact each other. Uh, but what happened with the place of the women? We are still working and trying to uh, let uh, the institution, the organization know that it's crucial the participation of women is crucial the participation of the young people because uh, to secure uh, or to confirm living in peace is not only for the leaders, for the politicians. We have to include also the uh, civil society, women of the civil society, women, religious uh, women uh, leaders and for, uh, women that are into the government. So if you ask me what today uh, peace means for me, of course, I can tell you that is the, uh, uh, the thousands of uh, uh, war or, or hate, but also let us talk about justice. If we are uh, making peace with men and with, groom, uh, with women working together, we are talking about justice. So we are uh, talking about that the peace which will become for sure because we have to work one another together. Thank you very much, Melody. And thank you for emphasizing the importance of women and especially young women as well, because those intersections, being a young person and being a woman also can be sometimes hindering our involvement in the peace processes. But Leila, can I please ask you to be the voice for Marilyn and provide us with her answer to this question? Jay Gurdjieff and Namaste to all. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this inspirational fireside chat and spending this time with you all. I am sorry I'm unable to participate live as we currently have power cuts in South Africa, but thanks to technology, I am still able to share my thoughts through video recording. So what does peace mean to me? For me, peace is an internal spiritual journey. It's about what kind of energy do you hold inside of you and what kind of energy are you sharing with the world? Is it one of love, calmness, and kindness? Or is it one of anger, hate, fear, or violence? So in experiencing negative emotions is a normal part of life, but when there's an intention to do harm, then we are not carrying a peaceful energy anymore. In Hinduism, we call this amhimsa, to practice nonviolence. So we always have to be aware of our inner state, which is not an easy thing to do, but I found meditation helps me to live more in awareness of that inner state. So when I find the negative emotions arising inside of me, I do actions like chanting and meditation to change the energy inside of me. My signal is my breath and my body language to be aware of my emotions. So I would define peace as it is a reflection in every word, thought, intention, and action. We have to live more in awareness as to how we affect each other and how to find peaceful, creative solutions to, to disturbing situations. How we treat ourselves, the earth, the animals, our parents, our neighbors, and even the beggar on the street is going to determine the kind of world we live in and the world we leave behind for our children. So the only way to bring peace is to this world is to first start within ourselves so we can find our inner strength to be instruments of peace and love to the rest of the world. And then this allows us to help others and to do service to the animals, to the, to the earth and to humanity. Thank you, Leila, for being Marilyn's voice. And um, I'm so happy that we really had the opportunity to hear from her, even though these, uh, the circumstances uh, prevented her for coming, from coming. But her answer was like, uh, I think it, it's a goal that we actually had 
the opportunity to hear from her, but I also see that Sharon uh, made comment uh, and said that for her, peace is all about creating a safe and inclusive environment for all. Thank you, Morgana, for being with us, and you also take care as well, and it's a it was a pleasure to have you with us, at least for, 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 for the beginning of this um, uh, conversation. And um, both of you mentioned religion when you were talking about peace, and both of you mentioned uh, interfaith cooperation. So my question now goes in the direction, could you share a little bit more about your motivation to involve yourself in interfaith dialogue and build peace also from this perspective, like use religion and interfaith dialogue in this, uh, in this manner? So Melody, if you could go first, please. Thanks. Okay, regarding my motivation, uh, I will go back two years when I was into primary school that I, I always was asking about other culture, other religions. As you well know, I live in Argentina, I born in Argentina, and we we have a, um, it's a diversity country, especially the city of Buenos Aires where I live. Uh, but most of the religions, especially when I was at primary school and secondary school, were the Abrahamic religions. Um, but always we live in an, let's just say a safe environment between all religions. And uh, my education was Islamic school, family from the same uh, Islamic community. So uh, even I have neighbors from other religions, pets and uh, traditions, all my primary and secondary school were inside the Islamic education. And, uh, but always I, I, I try to, to find the chance uh, to know about the others. And why I'm saying that? Because um, it was not uh, easy for me, even living in Argentina when I went to the university and we start to, to face different culture. And I mean, different way of life, a daily life. It's not the same like being fasting in an Islamic school that, mm -hmm comes Ramadan in a university and you have to explain uh, why you are fasting and you are Muslim and many people here in Argentina still don't know what what Islam means, what is the pillars of Islam and why there is uh, Muslim uh, people that are not Arab, for example. So for me it was not uh, difficult to explain it because always I like to explain and to share. Uh, I think, sorry, there is a microphone on. I think we, we already managed okay. it, thank you. Okay, so um, once I had the chance uh, that a program from uh, a cinematographical uh, a program for young people uh, wanted to meet uh, young from re different religions, um, the, I was selected to, to be part of it. And for me, it was really interesting because I spent uh, one week uh, living all together uh, from different religions in Argentina. I was like, it was like when I was like 16 years old or 15. So it was my first uh, experience, full experience regarding interfair. And uh, then I, I started to have uh, more experiences in other countries. And for me, the first one was when I, I you know, when, when I didn't feel safe. And this is the important thing. I mean, what I mean with this? I went to a conference with Muslim and Jewish young ar around the world. I, I, I went there, I was invited as a Muslim from Argentina. Uh, when I start to see how in other uh, countries and other communities, they live in peace, or they can talk things that I was not sure if I, I, I had the chance to say it. I mean, how we have to manage our time and think about the other. This is what happened with me. I start to understand that there is not only one truth. I mean, we all know this, but I was 18 years old and I was not as, as such involved in interfaith as I am nowadays. So sometimes because of our family, our community, our, uh, I don't know, our masjid depends of, uh, uh, of each other, but uh, we have like uh, one, uh, 
only uh, one uh, vision of a conflict or a way of life. So thanks of the experiences that I had, I start to understand that the peace or let's just say the interfaith, we can uh, get it thanks of the diversity. We should to meet with people who think different, who pray different, who believe different. And this is how we will uh, get more knowledge and we will get uh, richness of the different opinions. And we don't need to change our opinion or our religion or our practices. Uh, so when I start to understand that when I participate in an interfaith activity, I learn more about my religion because I want to share the opinion, the vision of Islamic practices in my case, I note that I'm, I'm winning. It's a win-win because we are winning each other because we understand the other culture, the other tradition, the our thought, the our reality because there is not only one reality, but also I'm becoming more uh, near to my religion, um, culture and practices, because they want to know about my practices. They want to know about my thoughts. So regarding this question, uh, why I'm motivated for the interfair is because when we say Islam, we are saying salam, that is peace. And Islam is a way of life. So if I'm not good with the others, how I can consider myself that is enough just to be only good with me, with myself, or, or the, the, the people who think like me and not with the ones that think different. Of course, I feel a great motivation to make interpret because it's something that I feel it. And it's really difficult to do it, even if we live in Argentina, far from many conflicts in the Middle East, it's not easy, but we know that the result at the medium of the way or at the end of the way, we are feeling more brothers and sisters, even the religion, the tradition, the facts, and the spiritual way. We know that we, we all have problems, we all have difficult in the different communities. And when we met each other, we know that if we are together, we can win all of us and give a contribution to our community of pets. Thank you, Melody. And when you were speaking, I felt the same because when I enter interfaith, I learned so much more about my own religion and I started feeling my Muslim female identity much stronger than before. And um, as you said, it's a win-win situation. So when you were speaking, I was like, I was like, I, this, she's echoing my my thoughts. And uh, Leila, once again, please uh, provide us with Marilyn's response to this question. Interfaith dialogue is very important for reflection, contemplation, and learning with each other. It is also very important for peace, shifting the mindset of people, and for changing the narrative about religion. When I read the introduction and the background to this webinar, it got me very engaged to wanting to understand and learn more. How do we see through the dogmas, the ignorance, the prejudice, and the judgments if we don't come together in good association to learn and give knowledge, truth, and light to each other. So seeing myself as a student of life and the greatest teacher is Guru and life itself, it motivates me to be in good association to learn from others. And this happens for me in these interfaith dialogues. These conversations hold the key for transformation and growth. Most of my learning in my Hindu faith happens this way with my Guru and devotees, and we call it satsang. There is strength in unity when a group of people come together to collectively support each other. The influence of association in, is extremely powerful. Your thinking, your habits, and the way you do what you do are all impacted and shaped in many ways by who you associate with. It is important to surround and associate yourself with people who inspire you to grow and transform spiritually regardless of your path. Hence, 
I feel interfaith dialogue is very important and this is what motivates me. Thank you, Leila, once again. It's so weird to not being able to thank to Marilyn for her for her answer, but um, I do hope when she will be uh, watching this recording, she will feel our uh, gratitude for, for her, um, let's say, absent presence. <laughs> I don't know, could I say this in English, but uh, uh, yeah, anyways, uh, we answered the question about a piece and about interfaith dialogue, uh, and at the beginning of this webinar, uh, or this conversation, actually, I was talking about eight pillars of positive peace. So uh, my question for my uh, guests is, when we look at these eight pillars of positive peace, what do we think, like, in advancing which pillars religion can play a significant role? Uh, like, where do we see religion uh, mostly contributing in which of these pillars? So, Melody, if we could ask you again to uh, answer, and maybe you can also say, like, where do you see women uh, in this uh, place as well in advancing positive peace? Thank you. Okay. okay, I'm sure, Amina, that when you read and you studied the the pillars of positive peace, you find for each of these those pillars, a verse of the Holy Quran. I'm sure about it. <laughs> so uh, when I, you, you make this question, it was like a little bit difficult for me to choose which of them I will talk about it. Uh, regarding the goodness, let me, just, I will read it again. Regarding the good relation with neighbors is something really interesting because we are always explaining to the people, uh, to the, those who, who, who learn from the media that Islam is a religion that uh, don't support women or don't want to make the peace with the other's religion or when there is a, any attack in any country or society, uh, we are all the time explaining this is not Islam, this is not what say Quran, this is what not Allah wants for us, and etc. So uh, I think that the the pillar of good relation with neighbors is something really interesting to to talk about it and to to think and research about what Islam says about it. And the first example that we have is from Rasulullah, from the Prophet Muhammad make peace be open him. Uh, Prophet Muhammad, in many times, uh, we, we can find uh, stories from his wife, his wife, sorry, Aisha radiallahu anha, where uh, she, she talks that uh, even maybe any neighbor was not good to him or attacked him, he was talking to them in peace. He was giving them the chance to talk in a, in a well manner. And uh, Aisha radiallahu anha says that uh, uh, the angel appear, um, uh, Jibril appears to him many times talking about uh, uh, the relation with neighbors. And uh, the, the relation the, uh, with neighbors is such an important as the relation with family uh, that there is many uh, hadith from Prophet Muhammad that talk about how we should to be good with them, accept them, the neighbors, be kind with them and trade them with justice. But also in the Holy Quran, in the verse uh, of Holy Quran in, in the chapter of uh, Al-Baqarah, in the same uh, sentence that talk about that be good with the, your family, be good with the women, with, good with men, says be good with neighbors. And I think that this is, is one of the steps to the way of making peace. Because in a neighborhood, in any neighborhood, we have people that, uh, uh, with a diverse of everything, thoughts, way of life, uh, religion, culture, background. So in Islam, it say many times how good we should be with the people that live near us. So it's like an invitation 
to live in a nice environment, even and especially if we are different. From the other way, we have the pillar, I don't know if I still have time, but I would like to, to choose another one, that is acceptance of the rights of others. Once again, when unfortunately there is any news about any country or a group that say in the name of Allah, in the name of Islam, we are um, taking out the right of the women, for example, or the right of, of, of the non-Muslim living in those countries, we know and we listen since we are kids or when, since we are young in the masjid, in our schools, Islamic schools, from the religion leaders that in Quran is very clear when it say that Islam is not compulsory, that Allah gives, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the message, gives the, the revelation, so uh, Archangel Gabriel to Prophet Muhammad in Quran, and we have the knowledge, we know it already, but no one is compulsory to follow something that they don't want. So this is very important because why? Because it's about what the freedom first, how do we feel that nothing should be compulsory? So acceptance, the right of others is really um, a pillar that uh, it's related to how Islam teach to respect the right of the others, not only in religion. Also, let us talk about uh, the poor. We cannot uh, live only our own life if we are not um, helping the people who are in, in need. So why? So this is why in Islam, we have many traditions in our uh, holy uh, festivities on or like Ramadan, like uh, the, uh, the culmination of the Ramadan and others that we have to, to pay, to give the zakat. And this zakat is for the persons who are in need and is mandatory to all we, we have the possibility to do it. So this is the right of other also, because we live in a society. We are not individuals living alone. Everything depends from the action of the other person. We are all responsible. So Islam invites us to protect the others, to, uh, to protect the right of the other person. So I think that these are some points that are interesting even to, to speak more about it, but it's impossible to make it in, in, in a fast time. Uh, so this is what was I wanted to highlight from, from them. Thank you. Thank you, Melody, and thank you for addressing two pillars. Actually, those two pillars are something that when I'm reading them, I mostly relate them to religion, but I'm sure religion can contribute to each eight of them, as you said. Um, and uh, now let's hear from Marilyn. And um, I'm very happy, Melody, that you provided us with very good examples from your own religious tradition and how they can contribute to these pillars. Leila. I think religion can play a part in all of the eight pillars of positive peace. The pillars are influenced by morals, ethics, and transformational behavior. And every faith through these scriptures and teachings can influence each pillar positively for peace. These pillars need the guidance of knowledge deeply rooted in truth, driven by a common goal of peace, and religious leaders and scriptural knowledge has the key to influence it in a positive way. Everything in life is integrated. You cannot exist in isolation. We can see this in nature, the, in the human body, and how society functions as a whole. It is a complex but integrated system. So likewise, these guiding pillars should be seen in a holistic way, and it has its specific function and importance, and religion has its integrated function and importance in it as well. It's great how Marilyn actually uh, pointed out that everything is integrated and everything functions together. And also in this theory of positive peace, all of these pillars are supporting each other. And without any of these pillars, the society is in, in, a, in a danger to go towards negative peace. 
And now for to wrap up this part of the conversation with our two uh, guests, I would like to ask very briefly, Melody, like in one minute to share with us maybe something from your religion, something from your practice, a quote that guides personally, you personally to advance peace, particularly positive peace. Something that you would just like to share with us very briefly, uh, if there is something like that, that you would like to, to other people to know. Okay, so we are with the number five. I will be <laughs> more quickly uh, to don't take too much time. I, I think that uh, regarding this uh, topic today about the women and positive peace, um, in Islam, uh, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to men and women all the time. If you make the translation into Spanish or in English, you will see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to men and to women. So I think that I, I will share a verse of Quran that is... Uh, was analyzed um, uh, by Asma Lambravet, that you know that is a great uh, uh, scholar and writer from Morocco, that uh, she talks about women in the Quran, women and men in the Quran. So I think that is uh, something really interesting to, to let us read it now and to think about it, because we have to work more and more. Uh, she, um, she writes in her book um, from Surah Al-Imram, uh, chapter number three, uh, verse of Quran 61, the following. And if anyone should argue with, sorry, with the about this, after all the knowledge that has come unto thee, says, come, let us summon our sons, our sons, your sons, our women, your women, ourselves, and yourself. And then let us pray together humbly and ardently. And let us invoke God's cure up, upon those who are telling a lie. Two things about this verse of Quran. I'm sorry for my, my English. Uh, one thing is that he's talking about men and women. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also is telling Prophet Muhammad because at that time, a group of Christians were visiting him. And Prophet Muhammad gave a, a space inside the masjid, the mosque, to them to let them pray and make their rituals. So we have two, two things here that are really important for a, a positive peace. The participation of men and women together and the respect of the other cultures and religion. We are talking about Prophet Muhammad who give a place inside the masjid to the Christian to pray there. Thank you, Marilyn. This was very powerful verse from the from the Quran, from the holy book. And this is very important on two levels, as you said, for women and also for involving people of other religions and other beliefs together with us. So thank you for sharing this that's guiding you in your peace endeavors and in your interfaith work. And now let's hear uh, for the end of this part of conversation from Mel Marilyn. So I love this question because it brings forth the two teachings from the Hindu faith that is universal and can be applied to everyone. The simple act of care and love teaches us how when we work together in partnership and as a team with a common goal that benefits the earth and the community, it creates a positive change on a bigger scale. We are not only setting the example of being the change we wish to see in this world, but we are showing love and care for everyone from a holistic perspective. In Hinduism, we call this Loka Sangraha, which means doing actions that benefits the whole of humanity the small act of service and positivity as a way of creating a positive ripple effect on the earth. If we had to measure each small positive act, it creates a positive act collectively in the bigger picture. So change happens in small steps. If our actions come from the intention in the spirit of a world family, despite our differences, diversity, religion, race, caste, color, and class, we become a beacon of love and light. In Hinduism, from the Maha Upanishads, 
We call this Vasudeva Kutumbakum, which means the world is one family. These two specific teachings guide all my interfaith work and service, and I see it instrumental in advancing positive peace. Doing actions for the benefits of all of humanity and seeing that the world is one family. Thank you. So Marilyn, if you are watching this, when you are watching this, thank you for sharing this with us. I think this is a wonderful way to wrap up this part of the conversation. And now we have some space and time for your questions and, and for your comments. We have some five minutes. I'm sorry, like <laughs> time flies really fast. Uh, but um, please, if you have something to share, some comment or some question uh, on the topics, on the questions or on the topic in general, feel free to raise your hand and we will provide you some space to speak. Let's say one to two minutes per uh, per input. So I see Liz Day already raising her hand. So please, the floor is yours. Um, hi, uh, my name is Lindsay, uh, Lindsay Simmons uh, from London. You can see in the chat. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me and for having this, uh, this fireside chat. I just wanted to, I, I mean, Everyone who has spoken, the two speakers have spoken with real um, passion um, and also with, um, I think, real experience. And I just wanted to note uh, what Melody had said with regard to uh, the scripture um, of the Quran. And I'm just, I, I work in, uh, in the field of peace building. Uh, that's why I'm here. Um, but I'm very interested in, in, um, religious sacred texts and I just wondered um really I was I, I was just wondering whether both either Melody or anyone here uh uses text itself to promote peace building and how they feel it is both mobilized as a force for good but also uh, maybe misappropriated um for the disrespect and the fear and the hatred um, of the other. Thank you, Lindsay, and we are very happy to have you here with us, and thank you for raising this question. Uh, I don't know, Melody, would you like to give some reflection on using scriptures and using uh, mm -hmm. the holy books for advancing peace, but also sometimes people use it for opposite, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So. Hi, Lindsay. Thank you very much for your question and, and to be here and for your comments. And I agree with you uh, that unfortunately we know that there are people that are using in the opposite way. But also, as uh, many Muslims, uh, what happened is that it's not easy just is to read the Quran and I underst and understand what is happening with this versicle of Quran. We have to understand the context. Sometimes it said something that maybe if you don't know what happened at that time, you will think that uh, God is saying to, to men to, um, uh, I don't know, to not protect women or to not give them the rights of women. And it's completely different. Maybe it's talking uh, about a situation that happened at that time. So first of all, I think that for us that we like the interfaith community and know about the right of women in, in, in different faith and religion are many books that are really useful like this one from Asma Landravets and others uh, writers that they talk about the context the story and she uh, shares some versicle of Quran so we we can understand what happened why there is this versicle of Quran saying this while others groups are uh, using this verse of Quran to attack or to make uh, uh, terrorism. Secondly, I'm, I think that we are still having a doubt, sorry, not a doubt, I don't know how to say it in English. We are still um, uh, working in, in the following. Uh, regarding women in Islam being leaders in our community is not common. But if we see the, the, the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we have the example of Aisha, we have the, the example of Fatima Zahra, we, we have the example of, 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 of Khadija, and we have the example of many women after 
that were leading communities, giving uh, uh, the proper uh, keys uh, uh, to, to make leadership. But what is happening now that uh, we are not taking the time, the properly uh, time to study these versicles of Quran and Hadith that prove uh, the women and men leadership and working each other. If we see in the Hadith of Prophet Muhammad, the narrations, most of the uh, narrations were uh, written by women. Why? Because when he talks, when he was even into the war, uh, there were women also, not only men. So what is happening in our communities, in, in, in some Islamic communities, that uh, we have to approach this and sitting in a table, men and women, and see all this vertical together. I don't know, Amina, if you are agree, but I think that we have more proofs to show that if we are doing women and religion and Islam or interfaith, we are not making something new or changing the message of Islam. We are continuing what Islam says. In Quran says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved the people that when, I'm not saying exactly, okay? But when they walk, they say salam, they say peace. So we have many proofs that the interfair and the right of women is part of Islam and is not again. Again. Absolutely, Melody. Thank you so much for sharing this with us and thank you for your passionate work because, and Lindsay said, both you and Marilyn are really passionate with what you do and uh, in the manner when you are speaking, but also all of the results of your work are, are showing how much dedicated you are to the, this work. And we need to have more conversations like this and we need to have more people speaking very clearly, very intentionally about this. And I think among uh, people in the same religious groups, need to talk to each other much more. We need to have more interfaith dialogue also, not just interfaith one. And we need to speak um, among ourselves as well as, as Muslims coming from different backgrounds and coming from different parts of the world, but also Christians, Buddhists, Hindus, uh, Baha'is, uh, giants. All of us need to speak also inside our religious groups and, and then also outside and talk to those who are let's say different and other to us, but by the time they become, they don't, they are not others anymore. They are like ours. So I think this was a wonderful conversation. It was marvelous and we don't have more time. We are already two minutes behind the schedule. And I have to say that I really enjoyed listening to each of you and I learned so much. I would especially like to thank to our guests, Melody and Marilyn, but also to all of you for attending, for listening to, and for sharing with us. And also don't forget to share the recording of the event with your communities. Our colleague Leila will post it on the URI Europe YouTube channel and share the link with you via email. So until the next time, I wish you all a pleasant rest of the day or night, depending where you are. And I hope to see you on some, of, on some other events. Goodbye and... Um, Please stay in touch.